The 1970s was a time of upheaval in America. The Vietnam War, Watergate, civil rights protests, and growing environmental concerns shattered public trust in institutions. This climate of disillusionment seeped into the film industry, with films like Taxi Driver, Network, and Chinatown capturing the era's unease through gritty, socially conscious storytelling. Amidst this wave of dark, reflective cinema, one filmmaker dared to envision something different. George Lucas, inspired by his childhood love for the swashbuckling adventures of Flash Gordon Buck Rogers, saw an opportunity to critique societal issues through a more optimistic lens. He crafted a story that was both timeless and timely, set in a galaxy where good triumphs over evil, hope and heroism reign supreme, and even the smallest individual can make a lasting impact. Through this vision, Lucas and his team revolutionized cinema itself, transporting audiences to a galaxy far, far away. taking your first step into a larger world. In a dimly lit screening room on the Warner Brothers lot, executives stared blankly at the screen as THX 1138 unfolded before them. In his directorial debut, the director had poured his creativity into this dystopian tale, crafting a story of humour, stylized visuals, and a narrative of an individual who rebels against a rigidly controlled society. A palpable lack of enthusiasm permeated the room as the final credits rolled. Eh? The Warner Brothers executives opted to trim five minutes off its runtime without implementing any substantial alterations. This decision resulted in a poor box office, mixed reviews, and an alienated director. This director was a young, talented man named George Lucas. Born at the tail end of the golden age of comics and cinema, Lucas found solace in art and storytelling fueled by a passion for adventure narratives and mythology. Dismayed by the corporate nature of Hollywood, Lucas' second film would be a different cinematic journey, inspired by his formative years in Modesto, California. Encouraged by friend Francis Ford Coppola, Lucas created American Graffiti, a nostalgic homage to the nation's fleeting pastime of teenagers in sleek hot rods driving down sun-soaked streets. Yet, during a visit to Coppola in New York, Lucas's whimsical impulse led him to explore the potential avenues for one of his following ideas, a fantasy space adventure. I've always been intrigued with Flash Gordon. I'm not going to do the voice. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. Mm -hmm. Every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. It was one of my favourite serials and comic books. I really loved adventures in outer space, and I wanted to do something in that genre. I tried to buy the rights to Flash Gordon. I'd been toying with the idea, and that's when I went, on a whim, to King Features. But I couldn't get the rights to it. They said they wanted Federico Fellini to direct it, and they wanted 80% of the gross. So I said, forget it. I can never make any kind of studio deal with that. I decided at that point to do something more original. I knew I could do something totally new. I wanted to take ancient mythological motifs and update them. I wanted to have something totally free and fun, the way I remember space fantasy. Lucas saw his space fantasy idea as an opportunity to provide younger audiences with an epic adventure experience that he was given watching adventure serials like Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon. I came to realise that there were very few films being made for young people between the ages of 12 and 20. When I was that age, practically all the movies were made for that age. I realised that since the western had died, there hadn't been any mythological fantasy movies available to young people like the ones I grew up on. Now all you get is cops and hard drama. I decided it would be much more useful for me to make movies that made kids have a fantasy life and feel good, so they could go ahead and have a more productive life. Lucas reaffirmed his space fantasy idea when he began pitching it to Coppola's children. When I mentioned to kids like Francis's sons who are 11 and 8 that I was doing a space film, they went crazy. In a way, I was using Francis's kids as models. Because I'm around them the most, they're the ones who I talk to about the story, I know what they like. During the post-production of American Graffiti, Lucas faced financial struggles and a crossroads for his next film, a space fantasy or Apocalypse Now. While his space fantasy lingered in the back of his mind, Lucas decided to focus on Apocalypse Now as his third film. Lucas wanted to explore the impact of power, imperialism, and humanity's descent into madness, using the ongoing Vietnam War as a backdrop. Lucas had developed strong reservations about America's involvement in the war, and had thus guided disillusionment towards America's leaders. As passionate as Lucas was about the project, no studio wanted to go near it. The Vietnam War was just too controversial. Concurrently, Universal was becoming confused and pessimistic about the prospects of American graffiti. Now poor and desperate, Lucas turned to his unnamed science fantasy project. A lot of my interest in Apocalypse Now was carried over into Star Wars. I figured that I couldn't make that film because it was about the Vietnam War, so I would essentially deal with some of the same interesting concepts that I was going to use and convert them into space fantasy. So you'd have essentially a large technological empire going after a small group of freedom fighters or human beings. Seated at his desk, Lucas delved into his creation, compiling lists of names, 
planets and conflicts. Notable characters such as Mace Windy, the Jedi, a Padawan learner, the skilled pilot Han, and the formidable Galactic Empire emerge from this early brainstorming. Influenced by films like Akira Kurosawa's The Hidden Fortress and John Ford's The Searchers, Lucas's initial 14-page treatment titled The Star Wars laid the foundation for a sprawling space epic. However, despite his efforts, United Artists and Universal failed to grasp the visionary nature of the project, leading to financial setbacks and rejection. A savior emerged in the form of Alan Ladd Jr., Vice President for Creative Affairs at 20th Century Fox. The studio was facing its own challenges due to aging management and several costly failures, leaving them eager for a breakthrough. Seeing potential in Lucas after watching a private screening of American Graffiti, Ladd Jr.'s interest prompted Fox to finance the screenplay development cautiously, allowing for an exit option if unsatisfied. With Fox's cautious support, Lucas devoted over a year to crafting the script. To Universal's surprise, American Graffiti became a major success financially and critically, earning Lucas a Best Director nomination at the Academy Awards. This triumph provided financial stability to Lucas, allowing him to settle personal debts, elevate his status in Hollywood, and focus on writing the Star Wars. Despite initial struggles with plot and character development, Lucas delved into extensive research on history, mythology, and fantasy. By 1974, Lucas had completed a nearly 200-page rough draft, incorporating elements like the Jedi Sith conflict, Darth Vader, Princess Leia, and the Death Star. A notable addition in this draft was the concept of the Force, initially referred to as the Force of Others. Influenced by diverse global ideas of God and the Spirit, Lucas saw this Force as a universal source of strength. It's sort of boiling down religion into a very basic concept. Uh, the fact that there is some deity or some power or some force that sort of controls our destiny uh, or uh, works for good and also works for evil is uh, always been very basic in mankind. Luke warned about the initial draft, Fox approved the second draft in August 1974, which Lucas preferred as he struggled to materialize the elusive movie he envisioned. Despite Fox agreeing on a second draft, Lucas faced challenges in budget estimation due to Fox struggling to realize how the film would look visually. To address this, artists like Ralph McQuarrie, Colin J. Cantwell, and Alex Tovolaris were enlisted to create illustrations, models, and storyboards despite Fox declining to finance them, forcing Lucas to cover their costs with his profits from graffiti. For Lucas, each step forward was a tug of war of the studio. Dissatisfied with the first draft, Lucas completed the second draft in January 1975, now adorned with the pulpy title Adventures of the Star Killer Episode 1 The Star Wars. Significant structural changes were evident, with Lucas starting the second draft in the middle of the first, at the robot's escape, and combining exciting scenes into a tighter, single film instead of the initially contemplated two movie plan. As producer Gary Kurtz attempted to sway Fox towards greater financial support by initiating interviews in London to transform the Star Wars into a functioning production, Lucas continued revising the second draft. A pivotal change saw the main character, Luke, transforming into a female protagonist, only to revert back later. Lucas, reflecting on this alteration, remarked, The original treatment was about a princess and an old man, and then I wrote her out for a while, and the second draft didn't really have any girls in it at all. I was very disturbed about that. I didn't want to make a movie without any women in it. Lucas resurrected the princess to address this. She replaced Deke Starkiller, who was initially tasked with obtaining the Death Star plans, resulting in a battle with Darth Vader on a rebel ship at the film's outset. As the pre-production continued, Lucas and Fox disagreed on his contract. Lucas's contract negotiations with Fox turned in his favor, in a tale of triumph for creative ownership and a horror story for Hollywood executives. Frustrated by Fox's strategic silence, Lucas, backed by the law officers of Pollock, Rigrod, and Bloom, was determined not to make concessions. Instead of attempting to increase Lucas's pay for the film, they instead secured ownership of sequel and merchandising rights, a deal that Fox eventually agreed to due to undervaluing the rights and their limited faith in the film and its director, except for Led. Despite ongoing challenges and skepticism in the industry, Lucas decided to shoot in England and North Africa. He established his special effects house, Industrial Light and Magic, or ILM, in Los Angeles. The driving factor behind this move were cost efficiency and creative control. Lucas gained the authority to commission specialized equipment, assemble his team, and closely oversee production by having his dedicated facility. Inspired by World War II footage of aircraft dynamically flying through the air, Lucas tasked ILM's visual effects supervisor, John Dykstra, with achieving fluidity of motion and special effects, enabling dynamic camera movement to create the illusion of capturing spaceships from a camera platform in space. 
However, concerns over completing 350 visual effects shots within a tight two-year schedule loomed, even as Fox reduced the theoretical budget. They just assumed they would all get done somehow and that it was our problem, not theirs. Despite Fox's reluctance, Lucas pressed forward, self-financing the groundbreaking special effects venture at ILM. With theoretical support from Fox, he invested over $87,000, equivalent to just over half a million dollars today, just within the first three weeks, determined to make his vision a reality. In the realm of special effects, one of the pivotal developments of ILM under John Dykstra's leadership was the creation of the motion control camera. Simply, it comprised a specialized camera, mechanical rig, and electronic control device collectively known as Dykstraflex. This technological leap revolutionized the efficiency and creativity of special effects in filmmaking. In order to grasp the significance of the Dykstraflex system, it's essential to understand the limitations of special effects technology at the time. Creating a scene with multiple starships in space required filming each film element separately. These separate film elements would then be painstakingly combined using an optical printer, which allowed the compositor to layer them into a single strip of film. This process is not only costly, but also incredibly complex. The miniature sets had to remain intact, referred to as hot sets, until the final film was approved, in case there were any areas that needed a reshoot. The complexity also meant that most shots had to be static. Moving the camera was virtually impossible, as it required perfectly matching the movement across all elements, which the existing technology couldn't achieve. Lucas envisioned a dynamic space battle for his film, with around 350 shots, each involving seven or eight elements, making the traditional approach too time-consuming and costly. The motion control camera solved these problems by allowing precise programming of repeated actions, creating dynamic visuals that made it seem like the footage was captured in space. Simultaneously, the production's art department expanded to capture Lucas's vision of a used universe. Lucas had a clear vision for the world he was constructing, aiming to depict Star Wars as if it were shot on location on an average everyday Death Star or Mos Eisley spaceport. Departing from the slickness of traditional science fiction, Lucas opted for a universe where devices, ships and buildings bore the marks of aging and dirt, enhancing the sense of realism and relatability in a distant universe. Amidst the chaos of setting up ILM and navigating budget discussions, Lucas faced the formidable task of casting actors. Opting for chemistry over star power, he sought relatively unknown talents. Harrison Ford's charm, Mark Hamill's youthful nature, and Gary Fisher's balance of toughness and warmth formed a compelling trio. Sir Alec Guinness joined as Ben Kenobi, although Lucas was also pursuing the idea of having the renowned Japanese actor Toshiro Mifune as Obi-Wan Kenobi. Lucas needed two tall actors for the roles of Chewbacca and Darth Vader, and found them in actor and healthcare assistant Peter Mayhew and bodybuilder David Prowse respectively. And Peter Cushing as Grand Moff Tarkin added depth as a human villain. Anthony Daniels and Kenny Baker were chosen for the iconic roles of C-3PO and R2-D2. Daniels initially hesitated about playing a robot until Lucas's infectious passion and dynamic vision won him over. Meanwhile, Baker was brought in during pre-production to test the robot's maneuverability. Fox remained hesitant to provide funds as the production geared up for a March 1976 start. Lucas urgently needed their commitment. Not only did the production team need time to build the robots and sets, but there was a palpable certainty that surpassing this date would jeopardize the actors in the robot suits due to the intense North African heat. The turning point occurred mid-October when Fox's concerns escalated into full-blown panic. Like others in the industry, the studio operated on the whims of shifting moods influenced by the latest box office or production reports. Around this time, Fox's imminent release of Lucky Lady mirrored the troubled trajectory of Star Wars. Both projects started independently, but encountered significant challenges midway, leading Fox to intervene and take control. Sensing an ominous parallel, Fox prematurely decided to pull the plug on Star Wars. The studio grappled with uncertainty about the film's goals and the pivotal role of special effects, compounded by ILM's investments in developmental technology, creating confusion among executives. There were lots of clashes. Equipment was being built that hadn't existed before, and uh, the people on the producer side were understandably quite anxious, uh, since nobody was able to say, this. we know this is going to work because it has worked. It was a case of take it on faith, it, it will work. The ultimate decision would be made at a board of directors meeting in December. Lucas made several changes to attempt to appease them, trimming the screenplay. A cut out scenes, the compromises had started and it was difficult because we had already cut it down to the bone and then we were faced with the fact that we had to cut it even further. One significant change from these cuts was removing scenes set on Alderaan, moving them onto the Death Star. This change had the fortuitous effect of giving the bad guys a single location, eliminating many scenes and concentrating the action to a more quickly moving story. The fate of the Star Wars hung in the balance, and on December 13, 1975, Fox finally gave the green light. 
with the board influenced by Adam Ladd Jr.'s unwavering support for Lucas. With the green light, every aspect from casting to set construction to special effects jolted back to life, rapidly accelerating into a frenetic pace. The fourth draft was finalised in January 1976. This iteration marked a significant step towards the iconic film we know today. Darth Vader's enigmatic presence in Star Wars took a profound turn in the fourth draft, revealing a deeper backstory involving a conflict between Ben Kenobi and Vader during their Jedi Knight days. Lucas envisioned Vader as a man-machine, describing the suit as a walking iron lung. Despite contemplating a scene revealing the horror beneath Vader's mask, Lucas opted to preserve the mystique, highlighting the machine's malevolence rooted in its human creator's intentions. Despite efforts to double their workforce, the entire production was six weeks behind the schedule. Whether the team were ready or not, the stage was set for production to commence, marking the culmination of Lucas's relentless pursuit to bring Star Wars to the big screen. If pre-production felt like a bad dream, production was a full-blown nightmare. Filming began in Tunisia, where the cast and crew were met with immediate delays due to malfunctioning props, electronic breakdowns, and unexpected storms. Lucas, with a calm facade, navigated the chaos. Production was divided into two units to counteract lost time, yet the schedule remained elusive. Entire shooting days in Tunisia had to be abandoned, with the tentative hope of rectifying shortcomings through pickups back in the US. Amidst the challenges of filming, Lucas, always forward-thinking, continued refining the script. A significant change involved renaming Luke's last name from Starkiller to Skywalker to avoid confusion with Charles Manson. Another crucial adjustment emerged when Lucas realised that the film needed more height and drama. Addressing concerns about Ben Kenobi's purpose post-Death Star escape and the Death Star's seemingly effortless getaway, Lucas decided to kill off the Jedi Knight. This choice not only introduced dramatic tension, but also allowed Lucas to convey a profound theme about death and its connection to the Force. Despite initial resistance from Sir Alec Guinness about portraying a ghost, Lucas convinced him of the narrative advantages. Reflecting on the situation, Lucas recalled persuading Guinness to stay by emphasising the importance of making the character impactful rather than just standing around. As the Tunisia shoot wrapped, Lucas faced deep dissatisfaction and a feeling of failure regarding the film's direction. Unforeseen challenges left him with only two thirds of the planned footage. Overwhelmed by depression, he skipped the rap party, highlighting his precarious mental state. I was seriously, seriously depressed at that point, because nothing had gone right. If things continued that way, I was never going to finish the movie. Everything was screwed up. I was compromising left and right just to achieve partial progress. I was in a state of profound unhappiness. The troubles continued in Britain. Lucas grappled with challenges in capturing the vast and elaborate sets while dealing with actors trying to decipher his nebulous dialogue. Describing the experience, Fisher remarked, Sometimes George would just say, Anything goes. If you want to change the dialogue, you can. Or he'd say, Faster or more intense. And I don't know what that meant. I just thought it meant I was not very good. But then I found out it was okay. I think Harrison told me. The dialogue was a little bit difficult. I remember there was one line that I just begged him to take out of the screenplay. And he finally did. Uh, and you it's remember one, the line? Yes. Boy, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I sometimes dream about this line. Uh, it was just coming upon the exploded planet of the princess, right. Alderaan, and it's Alderaan. All totally been blown away. And Harrison says, look, kid, I've uh, done my part of the bargain. When I get to an asteroid, you, the old man, and the droids get dropped off. And my line was, but we can't turn back. Fear is their greatest defense. I doubt if the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquilae or Soas. And what there is is most likely directed towards a large-scale assault. <laughs> And I thought, who talks like this, George? <laughs> I mean, this is really not fair because, you know, we're the ones that are going to get vegetables thrown at us, <laughs> not you. Additionally, clashes between Hollywood and British work cultures intensified. The rigid British schedule, marked by tea breaks, extended lunches, and a punctual 5.30pm wrap-up, clashed with the demands of Hollywood film production. This culture clash resulted in immediate complications, causing scenes that could have finished in the evening to spill over into the next day. This departure from the norm worried Lucas, who was accustomed to the more streamlined pace of independent filmmaking. The shoot, already running behind schedule, encountered further setbacks, including the departure of editor John Gibson due to creative differences. These differences arose primarily from Gibson's difficulty understanding Lucas's documentary-style vision for the film. Lucas wanted to capture the action in a raw, spontaneous manner, using the camera to create an immersive, dynamic experience akin to a documentary. This approach aimed to give the audience a sense of being in the middle of the action and of giving the locations a lived-in feel. Gibson struggled to align with this vision, leading to his departure from the project, leaving Lucas without an editor halfway through production. At ILM, another crucial decision was made when it became clear that the original plan to use front projection was not producing the desired results. 
Front projection involved projecting pre-recorded images onto a reflective backdrop behind the actors or models, creating the illusion of them being part of the scene. However, this method of limitations in terms of flexibility and visual realism. Realising their mistake, the team decided to switch to blue screen technology, which allowed them to film actors and models in front of a blue background and later replace it with any image or effect in post-production. Although this shift cost $100,000, equivalent to over half a million today, it provided far greater creative freedom and realism, making it the right choice for achieving the visual effects needed for the film. As the cast and crew trailed 15 days behind schedule, Fox mandated the Star Wars production to split into multiple units and concurrently shoot various scenes, emphasising the film's imperative completion by mid-July. Ultimately, the 84-day shoot concluded a staggering 20 days beyond schedule. Returning to ILM for post-production, Lucas encountered the daunting scenario of half the budget spent, one shot completed, and only eight months left to finish the film. Firing the editor during production led to restarting the editing process. To catch up, Lucas brought on editors Richard Chu, Paul Hirsch, and his wife, editor Marsha Lucas. ILM underwent a comprehensive restructuring to meet the tight deadline, with outside companies like 910 brought on to assist with special effects. Time constraints were so severe that 910 had only one day to shoot nine exploding X-Wings. Despite the setbacks, the dedicated team persevered, overcoming pre-production challenges and a tumultuous filming process. As more shots gained Lucas's approval, skepticism within ILM transformed into enthusiasm. Upon presenting the first assembly cut, editors acknowledged Lucas's visionary approach, but identified necessary changes to enhance the story. The opening sequence was streamlined, focusing solely on the battle without Luke and Biggs watching. Another cut scene was where Jabba the Hutt converses with Han, a choice made by ILM given the impracticality of creating the desired stop motion effect for Jabba within the given time frame. This meant that a lot of Jabba's dialogue was transferred over to Greedo. Ben Burt, hired during pre-production, now faced the challenging task of sound editing, cutting in effects alongside the evolving picture. Burt's meticulous work extended to creating most of the iconic sounds from the film, including the Jawa language, R2-D2's voice, the sound of the TIE fighters, the spaceship doors, the lightsabers, and Vader's breathing. As post-production neared its conclusion, the next phase, music, took center stage. John Williams, recommended to Lucas by Spielberg, composed the score with London Symphony Orchestra. Lucas, present during the recording sessions overseas, experienced immense satisfaction as the music harmonized seamlessly with the film. In a moment of shared joy, he even phoned Spielberg, allowing him to hear a live excerpt from the musicians. As the elements of editing, ILM, music and sound mixing converged, the film neared completion in March 1977. Most effects shots attained their final form, although not all matched Lucas's initial vision, often due to time or budget constraints. As Lucas puts it, the film wasn't finished, it was abandoned. With the release date 10 days away, the sound mix faced a staggering down to the wire workload but miraculously converged just in time for the May 25th, 1977 theatrical debut. Star Wars' impact was universal, transforming the cinematic landscape. Word of mouth fueled enormous lines, turning it into a cultural phenomenon. By October 13th, 1977, the film had expanded from 32 to 910 theatres, surpassing Jaws at the box office and solidifying its status as number one film of all time. The cinematic landscape of the 1970s found itself forever changed. Nothing else compared to the groundbreaking experience, and the world will never be the same. Star Wars is a cinematic triumph that not only propelled audiences to a galaxy far, far away, but also embedded itself in the collective consciousness as a modern day fairy tale. Lucas, inspired by Kurosawa's Hidden Fortress and by the timeless narrative structure defined by Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey, meticulously crafted the space odyssey that transcended its science fiction roots, moving into a mythic realm where archetypal heroes and villains clashed against the backdrop of a galactic struggle. Embarking on this retrospective journey, it becomes evident that Star Wars has become more than a cinematic experience. It is a cultural touchstone that ignited the imaginations of generations. However, as time has elapsed, the film has been lauded and criticised for its expansive legacy. What was once a fresh and alien world has, with each new parody, imitation and instalment within the same universe, morphed into a familiar, perhaps even tired, terrain. Today, in an era oversaturated in Star Wars media, revisiting the original 1977 film has unveiled a refreshing perspective, a return to the cinematic genesis that birthed a phenomenon and an opportunity to rediscover the magic that captivated the world in a time when the world needed it most. 
Star Wars, as I just mentioned, is often described as a modern day fairy tale, following the narrative structure of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. This framework outlines a universal pattern found in many myths and stories, where a hero embarks on an adventure, faces challenges, and ultimately returns transformed. In this retrospective, we will analyse Star Wars through the lens of the hero's journey to explore how it functions as a contemporary fairy tale, while also delving into Lucas's real world inspirations and the behind the scenes moments that brought the film to life. By examining key elements like the call to adventure, the presence of mentors and allies, and the hero's trials and transformation, we will uncover the timeless themes and storytelling techniques that have made Star Wars a beloved classic across generations. Let's get started. Star Wars opens with the iconic text, A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, immediately establishing a fairy tale influence. Lucas described this influence as a compilation of dreams, using them as history to create a new one. This text immediately shows the setting as distant in time and space, creating a sense of timeless mythology, appealing to the feeling of escapism and grandeur. The bold Star Wars text following the introduction reinforces the film's cinematic style, acting as a bridge between the fairy tale preamble and the impending space opera adventure. The title and opening crawl pay homage to Lucas's love for adventure serials, efficiently providing exposition in an episodic storytelling style. Inspired by Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon serials, the scrolling text introduces the galaxy's state, key players, and the conflict between the Rebel Alliance and the Galactic Empire, without overwhelming the audience. At this stage, all we need to know is that there's a civil war between the Rebels and the Empire. The Rebels are on the run after acquiring the plans for the Empire's new space station, the Death Star. As the crawl concludes and the camera pans to reveal the vastness of space, the adventure starts with a Rebel ship desperately fleeing the approaching Star Destroyer. Already, visually, we understand the dynamic of the conflict without a single word spoken, emphasising the overwhelming power of the Galactic Empire. The Rebels find escape impossible as the Star Destroyer immobilises their ship. Inside the ship, the Rebels scramble to defend whilst two droids, C-3PO and R2-D2, take centre stage, attempting to escape from the captured ship. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really- Their introduction is fantastic, introducing a human-like element from the unlikeliest of places. The banter and camaraderie between these two humanise the story, inviting the audience to embark on an epic journey through the lens of characters beyond traditional human protagonists. The film further humanises the droids by portraying their attempt to escape from the besieged rebel ship, implying a sense of self-preservation and value for their existence. This injection of humour and character dynamics amidst the chase's intensity adds depth to the narrative, making the galactic adventure not only epic, but also resonant on a more personal level. After capturing the ship, the Empire efficiently destroys the rebel resistance, culminating in Darth Vader's dramatic reveal. She's an icon, she's a legend, and she is the moment. Now come on now. Vader's ominous presence, his black suit against the rebel ship's stark white walls, accentuates the imminent threat. The Empire's ruthless entrance provides an excellent opportunity to explore the allegorical layers of the Empire in the Star Wars narrative. George Lucas openly acknowledged infusing his political views into the films, stating in a 2005 interview with the Boston Globe, I love history, so while the psychological basis of Star Wars is mythological, the political and social basis are historical. The most evident allegorical comparison is with Nazi Germany, where the Emperor mirrors the head of state, wielding absolute control. The Empire's industrial apparatus sees individuals as expendable assets, reflecting a militaristic regime. Subtle racism manifests in the Empire's preference for humans over diverse alien species, and the term stormtroopers draws inspiration from the Nazis' parliamentary wing. However, Lucas's strong views on the Vietnam War add another layer to the Empire's allegorical significance. In his perspective, the Empire conveys Lucas's view on America at the time, or more accurately, the Empire represents Lucas's fear of where the US was heading. The Empire symbolises unchecked government power, embodied by the military-industrial complex of the Death Star, and Vader's authoritarian rule. You did something very interesting with Star Wars, if you think about it. The good guys are the rebels. They're using asymmetric warfare against a highly organised empire. So it was a very anti-authoritarian, very kind of 60s, against the man kind of thing. The irony of that one is, in, in both of those, the little, the little guys won. Right. And the big, highly technical Im the, empire. The English empire. Right? English the English empire, empire, the American empire, yeah. lost. Yeah. That was the whole point. Essentially, the empire and the two main villains serve as a cautionary tale against the dangers of unchecked government authority, resonating with historical and political contexts. Back on the rebel ship, Vader confronts the rebels through ruthless interrogation. 
Despite David Prowse performing the character physically, Lucas sought a different voice for Vader. While I can sympathise with Prowse about being unable to serve both the physical and voice roles, you can't blame Lucas for making the change and comparing the voices. Where is the data you intercepted? What have you done with those information tapes? We intercepted no information! The Death Star plans are not in the main computer. Where are those transmissions you intercepted? What have you done with those plans? We intercepted no transmissions! Renowned actor James L. Jones was hired by Lucas in the later stages of post-production. Jones's deep, modulated voice coupled with a commanding delivery completes the character as a symbol of terror. Respecting Prowse's performance, Jones refused to be credited for his role in the film. As the Imperials close in, a desperate Princess Leia stores a Death Star plant within R2-D2, with the two droids managing to flee through an escape pod. And now we've reached the first plot hole in the Star Wars films, and trust me it won't be the last. That being said, the Imperials decided not to shoot the escape pod that carries C-3PO and R2-D2 because no life signs were detected. Now, logically, the Imperials can't hit the escape pod, otherwise there just wouldn't be a film. There have been attempts to explain this plot hole, as according to the official canon on the Wikipedia website, when Hija pointed the pod out, his superior officer Gunnery Captain Bolvin ordered him not to shoot, as there were no readings of life signs on board and Imperial regulations that tied Gunnery officers' promotions to their kill ratios would label shooting an empty escape pod as a wasted shot. Now, based on the film and the TV shows, if the Empire is measuring shots to kill ratios as a means of promotion, no one in the Empire would ever get promoted. Anyway, Leia is captured, accused of being a traitor to the Empire by her estranged father, and is now a prisoner. Concluding that Leia must have hidden the plans in a droid in the fleeing escape pod, Vader dispatches stormtroopers down to the planet in search of the plants. I made a Darth duty. I sithed my pants. My diaper's gone over to the dark side. I got pages of these, I could go on. Landing on Tatooine, C-3PO and R2 find themselves in unknown territory, showcasing Lucas's world-building approach. The arid, expansive desert landscape starkly contrasts the confined and metallic environment of the rebel ship. The wide shots capturing the vastness of Tatooine establish a sense of isolation and emphasize the character's vulnerability in an unfamiliar and harsh environment. Barely a few hundred meters from the escape pod, the pair begin arguing over which way to go to reach safety, eventually deciding to go their separate ways. To add to the universe's uniqueness, Lucas wanted some of the droids, such as R2, to communicate through beeps and whistles. Lucas wanted R2 to sound like an electronic five-year-old kid. To achieve this, Bert would speak into a microphone attached to a synthesizer to create this sound, resulting in a blend of human and electronic sound. Where do you think you're going? Well, I'm not going that way. This unique voice gave character to R2, allowing editors to cut to R2 for reactions. As the droids journey separately, Lucas uses wide shots to capture the expansive desert landscapes, reinforcing the character's smallness. The Tatooine Desert's golden and brown hues symbolically contrasts with C-3PO and R2's metallic design. R2's scene in particular, marked by wide and high angle shots, alongside the eerie silence punctuated by the beeps and whistles of R2, creates an atmosphere of unease, inviting audience sympathy. In Lucas' initial edit, the opening sequence featured additional scenes crucial in introducing Luke Skywalker and delving into his background. Luke witnesses the battle in space through binoculars, setting the stage for his involvement. A conversation with Biggs' Dark Lighter reveals Luke's conflicting emotions, torn between admiration for Biggs and a sense of duty to his uncle and Tatooine, creating a nuanced dynamic. Despite the significance of these scenes and providing depth to Luke's character and motivations, they were strategically removed from the final cut. The decision was fueled by considerations such as information overload for the audience and a realization by Lucas that narrating the story from the droid's perspective heightened Tatooine's alien and threatening ambience, aligning with the film's overarching thematic choices. Before, by showing Luke on the planet, there was no mystery. You knew the planet was inhabited by people. But now when you go to the planet with the robots, you don't know what you're going to find. Unfortunately for R2, he's walked into a trap. Captured by opportunistic Jawas and tossed into their sand crawler among a vast array of scrap and damaged droids. Reunited with C-3PO, the pair is now trapped to be sold by the Jawas. To create the Jawa language, Bert studied several African dialects, in which he would have employees record and then speed up or alter. Jawa, 
Now controlled by the Jawas, the droids are selected for sale at the next farm, which happens to be the home of Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru, as well as a young twink, oh, hang on, um, oh sorry, hang on, uh, a young man named Luke Skywalker. While this scene wasn't originally meant to be Luke Skywalker's introduction, the scene seamlessly adapts to this new role. It works because it showcases the context of Luke's daily life. His frustration with his uncle and his interaction with the droids establish him as a relatable, if pretty, character. But I was going into Tashi Station to pick up some power converters! The audience witnesses his daily struggles, aspirations and resourcefulness, forming an immediate connection with the young farmer. As Uncle Owen hires Cethropia in a humorous exchange, Of course you haven't, sir. Not in an environment such as this. That is why I have been programmed. Luke receives instructions from Uncle Owen to refurbish Cethropia in a red R5 unit. However, as R2 witnesses his best man abandoning him in a pretty dodgy act, the R5 unit conveniently experiences what I feel when I stare at a blank page. This R2 unit has a bad motivator, look! Seizing the moment, Cethropia persuades the Skywalkers to bring R2 into their employ. In the garage, Luke begins cleaning the droids while simultaneously daydreaming of a life beyond the confines of a farm. Mark Hamill's performance and poignant dialogue offer the audience profound insights into Luke's character, revealing a relatable blend of youthful frustration and an earnest yearning for adventure. The mere mention of the rebellion snaps Luke out of his daydreaming haze, sparking genuine excitement for a life beyond Tatooine. What's excellent about Luke's character is that, despite his whiny demeanour, Luke's desire to break free from the monotony of a farm life resonates with many viewers who have experienced similar yearnings for something more. It's a classic fairy tale archetype expressed visually in a relatable way. The narrative takes a swift turn as R2 projects Princess Leia's holographic message, injecting urgency into the narrative, while fueling Luke's longing for adventure. The reference to a mysterious man named Obi-Wan Kenobi adds an intriguing layer, setting the stage for the introduction of a mentor figure. Using holographic technology as a messaging system adds a futuristic touch and engages the audience. Behind the scenes, Carrie Fisher's performance was captured by standing on a turntable, allowing dynamic angles that seamlessly integrated her performance into the garage and Ben's house scene. However, Luke's frustration mounts when R2 refuses to play the remainder of the message, abruptly pulling him back into the harsh reality of farm life as Aunt Beru calls for his attention. Luke's yearning for adventure is reinforced in the dinner scene. The family dinner adds realism and relatability to the fantastical setting, allowing the audience to connect emotionally with Luke's aspirations and struggles. The subdued natural lighting and practical effects, such as the iconic blue milk, create an intimate yet fantastical atmosphere. Uncle Owen's protective nature and reluctance to let Luke join the Academy contrasts with Aunt Beru's more empathetic understanding of his yearnings, emphasising emotional beats and unspoken tensions. When Uncle Owen refuses to let Luke leave, he storms off, serving as a catalyst for Luke's character arc, with his frustrations becoming the driving force for his transformative journey. If the dinner scene conveyed Luke's frustrations and a wish for more, then the twin sun scene cements it. The scene is a cinematic masterpiece that intertwines breathtaking visuals, emotional depth, and symbolic significance. Shots of the binary sunset over Tatooine's horizon creates an iconic image, emphasizing the grandeur of the moment and the isolation of Luke Skywalker's homestead. Honestly, this scene works so well because it's fundamentally human, with the twin suns symbolizing the universally relatable representation of aspiration. This scene is a pivotal moment in Luke's character development, as his silhouette against the setting suns visually captures his internal struggle and desire for something greater. These last few scenes have done a great job of capturing Luke's character. And yes, now it's time to talk about John Williams. John Williams' score for Star Wars is nothing short of a musical masterpiece. From the very first notes of the iconic central theme, Williams establishes an emotional and auditory journey that enhances the entire Star Wars experience. I can't imagine how Lucas felt hearing it for the first time. The score complements the narrative and elevates it to a level of epic grandeur that has left an indelible mark on film history. Decades after its release, the Star Wars score remains timeless. It's a testament to John Williams' genius that these compositions continue to evoke the same emotions and excitement in new generations of viewers. Star Wars' music isn't just a soundtrack, it's a symphony of storytelling, a sonic force that has transcended the boundaries of cinema and become an integral part of cultural history. Returning from his soul searching, Luke finds Cethopia hiding in the garage, revealing that R2 has run off to find Obi-Wan. Cethopia and Luke search for R2 in the morning. The simple use of a mirrored skirt to create the land speed of hovering effect is pretty seamless. They're quickly spotted by Tusken Raiders, who give chase. 
The Banthers, portrayed by Margie, an impressive 22-year-old Asian elephant weighing 8,500 pounds, adds authenticity to the universe. Despite initial concerns about the weight of the Banther headgear, Margie seemed to revel in the role, playfully engaging in nearby creek antics between takes. I don't know, I just think that's neat. Upon locating R2, the droid anxiously announces that several Tusken Raiders are approaching. Luke, eager for adventure, attempts to find them. However, Luke has overestimated his abilities and is attacked by the Tusken Raiders. The dynamic choreography and quick cuts intensify the action, capturing Luke's genuine expressions of terror, heightened by the limitations of the Raider actor's visibility in the costume. Knocked out by the Raiders, Luke is saved by Obi-Wan, who causes the Raiders to flee by using the force to elevate his voice similar to a crate dragon. Obi-Wan's use of this ability comes off a bit ridiculous for several reasons. First, the scene is somewhat ambiguous, as the film does not explicitly explain what Obi-Wan is doing or how he's doing it. Secondly, this ability is never seen or mentioned again in the story or any of the subsequent Star Wars films, which makes it feel like an odd, one-off power that lacks consistency within the larger narrative of the Force capabilities. Additionally, the moment feels out of place because the sound effect used for the Crate Dragon's roar, as I've always perceived it, comes across as comical, especially when combined with Obi-Wan stumbling around like he's a drunk returning from a bar. It diminishes the intended dramatic impact and makes it seem like a less powerful use of the Force and more like a quirky plot device used to move the story forward. Nevertheless, Obi-Wan's timely intervention establishes him as a mentor and a wise guide, marking a crucial turning point in the hero's journey. Hello there. Waking up, Luke explains the situation and says that R2 is looking for an Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, he claims to be the property of an Obi-Wan Kenobi. Is he a relative of yours? Do you know who he's talking about? The mere mention of the name provides a knowing look from Ben. The gravity of this revelation is enhanced by John Williams' score, emphasizing the pivotal moment. With the admission that he is indeed Obi-Wan, the group decides to journey back to his home, laying the foundation for a mentor-student dynamic that will profoundly shape Luke's destiny. There are some excellent videos on YouTube that indicate this scene of everyone discussing the Clone Wars and his adventures with Luke's father with footage from the prequels. What always stands out to me in those videos is how remarkable Sir Alec Guinness is in this film. His performance is the first instance of Star Wars elevating from a fairy tale film into a tragic epic. Just a tremendous emotional scene from an acting veteran. Obi-Wan Kenobi reveals his Jedi past to Luke, blending narrative revelations with character development. Obi-Wan's storytelling weaves in elements of the then unknown Star Wars mythology, portraying Jedi as mystical warriors drawing power from the Force. The mention of Luke's father's tragic fate at the hands of Darth Vader introduces a profound emotional conflict that resonates throughout the saga. The revelation of Luke's familial connection to the Jedi adds layers to his narrative, transforming the personal journey of a farm boy into an epic tale of destiny and legacy. The scene also reinforces the Empire's origins, the Jedi's near extinction and the rise of the Empire, creating a backdrop of oppression and emphasizing the dark times in which the galaxy finds itself. The lightsaber's symbolic passing underscores the responsibility and weight on Luke's shoulders. However, it's incredible that Luke didn't hurt himself or anyone when handling the lightsaber for the first time. Now, this scene could easily be dismissed as an info dump, and technically speaking, it is just straight up exposition. While info dumps are generally discouraged in storytelling, their effectiveness often depends on the execution and the context of the narrative. Star Wars, in my opinion, executes its exposition really well. The info dump is not just about world building, but also contributes to the development of Obi-Wan's character. It reveals his history, connection to Luke's father, and the burden he carries as a Jedi. With Guinness's performance, you can tell that this story isn't easy for Obi-Wan to relive. It pains him to admit his past to Luke. It feels like a natural, authentic conversation, like a grandpa or great-grandpa painfully retelling war stories. This adds depth to Obi-Wan's character and helps establish a personal connection between him and the audience. Obi-Wan returns to the problem as R2-D2 plays Leia's entire message, calling for Obi-Wan to deliver the Death Star plans to Alderaan with a now iconic final line. Help me. The call to adventure further expands the narrative scope, intertwining Luke's personal journey with the more significant galactic conflict. Although initially keen to escape the farm, Luke hesitates when the opportunity is presented. Luke's initial reluctance to accept the call to adventure adds a layer of realism to his character while aligning with the hero's journey archetype, where the protagonist initially rejects the transformative quest. 
Luke's hesitation reflects relatable human emotions. It's one thing to say you want to do more of your life, and it's another to make that step when the opportunity is handed to you. While Luke hesitates, the Empire's commanders discuss the Rebels' threat and the Death Star's vulnerability. The scene unfolds in the authoritarian Death Star command room, reinforcing the Empire's oppressive nature, with the rigid lines and cold colour palette mirroring the heartless efficiency of its commanders. Grand Moff Tarkin's introduction as political intrigue and hierarchy portrayed with authority by Peter Cushing. Vader's mastery of the dark side is showcased when insolently challenged by a commander, highlighting the malevolent capabilities of the Force. Although I must say that I have a massive respect for this guy, telling his evil, asthmatic cyborg boss that his religion is bullshit during a work meeting. The Emperor's enforcer embodies fear and unquestioning loyalty even within the Empire. The restraint imposed by Tarkin adds a layer of complexity to the power dynamics within the Empire. Establishing the formidable alliance between Tarkin and Vader while showcasing the hierarchy of power within the Imperial structure. What's interesting about this scene is that, from a storytelling perspective, Vader's use of the Force contradicts Obi-Wan's explanation of the Force told just moments before. While Obi-Wan describes the Force as an energy field created by all living things, connecting everything and binding the galaxy together, emphasizing its positive and harmonious aspects, Vader's use embodies a darker and more aggressive side of its capabilities. Instead of using the Force for knowledge or defense, Vader employs it as a tool of intimidation, control, and punishment. This contrast underscores a central theme in Star Wars, the dichotomy between the light and dark sides of the Force. While Obi-Wan and the Jedi advocate for a balanced and harmonious use of the Force, Vader's actions exemplify the corrupting influence of the dark side, where power is wielded for personal gain, control, and dominance. Back on Tatooine, the group discovers that the Sandcrawl has been attacked by the Empire. While Obi-Wan blatantly lies about the skills of the Stormtrooper, Luke realizes in horror that the Empire will be led back to the farm. Racing back home, he discovers that the Empire has come and gone, brutally burning his aunt and uncle alive. The remnants of the burned homestead set a somber and desolate tone, symbolizing the irreversible loss and brutality of the Empire. The cinematography captures the devastation with wide shots that emphasize the scale of the tragedy and close-ups that convey the emotional toll on Luke. Lucas has a great quote that explains the importance of this scene thematically and narratively. Usually, the hero has to come to a decision on his own by observing and realizing the position he's in and moving forward. This time, the hero avoids that position, but then I have the position thrust upon him, because it's inevitable. When the challenge comes from Ben at his home after he gets Leia's message, Luke immediately rejects it. He wants to go fight the Empire, you can tell that he wants to, but he doesn't feel that he can take on the responsibility. As a result, destiny comes into play, because if you don't do anything about the Empire, the Empire will eventually crush you. To not make a decision is a decision. It happens in all countries when a certain force, which everybody thinks is wrong, begins to take over and nobody decides to stand up against it, while the people who stand up against it can't rally enough support. What usually happens is a small minority stands up against it, and the major portion are a lot of indifferent people who aren't doing anything one way or the other, and by not accepting the responsibility, those people eventually have to confront the issue in a more painful way, which is essentially what happened in the United States with the Vietnam War. Hamill's performance in this scene is also very effective, initially looking away in horror, then, in line with Lucas's view on the inevitability of destiny, looks back and faces the horror, knowing that he must stand against it, transforming Luke's personal quest into a larger struggle against oppression. The burning homestead becomes a visual metaphor for the destruction of Luke's innocence and the harsh realities of the galaxy he inhabits. Luke's acceptance of the call to adventure marks his transition from a reluctant farm boy to a heroic adventurer. This moment empowers Luke, propelling him into the rebellion against the Empire and setting the stage for his character growth. Meanwhile, on the Death Star, Vader begins interrogating slash torturing Leia for information. I don't really have any analysis for this scene, other than I've always found this robot to be so unbelievably stupid. Well, less of the robot and more of the obvious medical needle. I don't know, it's just the one element of the production design that doesn't work for me. Obi-Wan leads the group to a wretched hive of scum and villainy in search for a pilot. On their quest, Obi-Wan subtly uses the Force to influence stormtroopers, showcasing his Jedi abilities without resorting to violence. This moment establishes the Force as a powerful tool for the Jedi, and setting the stage for the broader range of Force powers. To find their pilot, Obi-Wan leads the group into a local cantina, where we are treated to one of the best scenes in the film. The cantina scene is iconic, presenting a vivid and eclectic setting filled with diverse alien species. Stuart Freeborn's practical creature effects showcase innovative puppetry and prosthetics, although admittedly, some creature effects are better than others. Some just look like slightly tampered with Halloween masks, and is that the actual devil? 
The cantina serves as a microcosm of the galaxy's diverse cultures and characters, offering the audience, and also Luke, a glimpse into the vastness of this universe. John Williams' cantina band music enhances the scene's atmosphere, capturing a futuristic take on 1930s swing. Figurin Dan and the Modal Nodes, an all Bith music band, embody the sound diegetically, with their specialization in the genres of jazz and jizz. That's what it's actually called. Uh, anyway, uh, the sound design and alien language add to the bustling intergalactic feel. Story-wise, the droids are told to stay outside, and Luke makes his way into the bar. Look, hero or not, I just I can't abide this shirt tuck on the bartender. Just incredibly poor bar etiquette. This poor showing from Luke is what causes the two gentlemen next to him to start antagonizing him. Obi-Wan attempts to calm the situation, but swiftly cuts down the men when they begin to get physical. The quick cuts and flashes of the lightsaber emphasize the power and mystique of Obi-Wan and the Jedi, and I love how calm and composed he looks before sheathing his lightsaber. After a brief chat with Chewbacca the Wookiee, the group is led to the pilot Han Solo. Han's introduction establishes his mercenary persona and sets the stage for his eventual transformation into a reluctant hero. The warm lighting accentuates Han's charisma, creating a visual magnetism that draws attention to the character. Luke's impulsive nature and Han's pragmatism create an intriguing dynamic that will evolve throughout the story. The negotiation between Han, Luke, and Obi-Wan is crucial for character introductions and plot development. Han's initial greed to take on the job showcases his self-interested nature. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan's calm and composed handling of the negotiations starkly contrasts Luke's hot-headedness. Sir Alec Guinness's measured performance as Obi-Wan reinforces the wisdom and experience of the Jedi, highlighting the mentor-student dynamic between him and Luke. Having reached an agreement, Obi-Wan and Luke escape the prying eye of the Empire, while Han can't believe his luck until he runs into Greedo. Greedo works for Jabba the Hutt, an enigmatic figure in the film who will be discussed later. Jabba wants the money that Han owes him, and Greedo is here to collect. Han attempts to navigate the dangerous situation through his roguish charm and resourcefulness. Still, when that fails, Han doesn't hesitate to shoot Greedo, portraying him as a rogue willing to take decisive action for self-preservation. Famously, subsequent edits to the scene have altered the timing of the shots, fueling discussions about character morality and the betrayal of Han's persona. But again, we'll get to all that later. Covering the trip's cost by selling his land speeder, Luke, Obi-Wan and the droids head to the hangar, unknowingly tracked by Imperial spies. Upon arriving, Luke expresses disdain for the Millennium Falcon, embodying Lucas's vision of a used and unique world. Lucas wanted the ship to look unique, something with personality. To achieve this, he pitched this ship to the production team as a flying hamburger. The team was so proud of their work on this ship that all 11 artists who participated signed their names on the finished model. I also enjoy this small moment where Han is immediately annoyed by C-3PO. A shootout with stormtroopers erupts, leading to a thrilling escape by the Millennium Falcon. The sequence, combining miniature models, motion control photography, and blue screen backdrops, showcased groundbreaking filmmaking techniques at the time. Combined with the tight shots, fast paced dialogue, and rapid editing contribute to the suspense as the crew navigates the escape. As the Millennium Falcon successfully eludes the clutches of the Empire, the Death Star ominously hones in on the unsuspecting older run. Being able to resist Vader's physical torture, Leia becomes the target of Grand Moff Tarkin's ruthless ingenuity. Tarkin issues an ultimatum. Either Leia confesses the location of the rebel base, or Alderaan will become a chilling testament to the Empire's might. Leia's character takes center stage, her unwavering defiance confronting the heartless machinations of the Empire. The imposing physical presence of the two film's primary villains further closes the spatial confines around Leia, accentuating her vulnerability. Leia succumbs to the immense pressure, revealing the rebel base's location. Tarkin remains unswayed. Leia's compliance is irrelevant. The decision to proceed with the test firing, regardless of Leia's compliance, underscores the ruthlessness of Tarkin's character and the Empire's unwavering commitment to asserting dominance. In this pivotal moment, Tarkin's callous disregard for life and his revelry and manipulation solidify his status as one of the film's standout antagonists, whilst reinforcing Lucas' view on the Vietnam War, using overwhelming power and technology to absolutely devastate a group of ragtag rebels. The impressive explosion of the planet demonstrates the power of the Death Star. The production team used a gas explosion that consisted of wood fibres for the explosion. The pieces of wood would silhouette to give the feeling of the planet's core. Attuned to the Force, Obi-Wan senses Alderaan's destruction and attempts to mentor Luke amid the cosmic tragedy. 
The scene also introduces thematic depth through character dynamics. Han Solo's pragmatism stands as a foil to Luke's dedication to the Jedi teachings, even though Luke only learnt of the Force like most likely a day ago. On the Death Star, Tarkin and Vader learn Leia misled them. Enraged, Tarkin demands Leia's execution, increasing narrative tension. Leia's choice to protect the current location of the Rebel base, even at the tremendous cost of her home planet and the lives of those she holds dear, underscores Leia's unwavering commitment to the Rebel cause and her willingness to make personal sacrifices for the greater good. This emotional and moral complexity adds depth to Leia's character, making her a relatable and compelling protagonist within the film. On the Falcon, the crew arrives at what's left of Alderaan. Confused but staying true to his bravado, Han tracks an Imperial TIE fighter heading for a small moon. The impact of this scene is heightened through one absent aspect of the film. The score has been absent in the last few scenes. Instead, the audio is filled with diegetic sounds and dialogue. Until this moment. There, he's almost in range. That's no moon. It's a space station. It's too big to be a space station. Holding off the score until Obi-Wan's realisation enhances that moment and raises the tension that both the character and the audience feel simultaneously. Escape is impossible, as the Falcon is trapped in the tractor beam, pulling them into the Death Star. The return of John Williams' score, crescending into an iconic melody, marks the Falcon's dramatic landing in the Death Star hangar bay. Suspicious about the captured ship, Vader reaches the hangar. Immediately, Vader senses Obi-Wan's presence, building a sense of mystique and anticipation. Disguised in Stormtrooper uniforms, Han and Luke attack the hangar bay control room. Thanks to R2, the group learns about the Falcon's inability to escape due to the operational tractor beam. This development propels Obi-Wan Kenobi into a solo mission to deactivate the device. Obi-Wan Kenobi's final words to Luke resonate as a poignant and foreboding moment. The Force will be with you. Always. These words reflect Obi-Wan's faith in the Force and symbolize the torch's passing to the next generation of Jedi. The phrase, the Force will be with you, becomes a recurring motif throughout the Star Wars saga, encapsulating the essence of Jedi teachings. In this instance, it guides Luke's immediate actions in a broader metaphor for embracing inner strength and intuition. As Obi-Wan sneaks off into the ominous corridors of the Death Star, leaving Luke and the group behind, the impact of his farewell reverberates through the narrative. This moment marks a significant turning point, not only in the imminent rescue operation, but also in the evolution of Luke's character as he begins to grapple with the responsibilities and challenges of embracing the Force. As soon as Obi-Wan departs, Han and Luke begin bickering. Their two ideologies clash. I love this small character moment of Han leaning on Chewie. It really showcases their bond while also feeling straight out of American graffiti. Amid the Death Star's control room tensions, R2 reveals Leia's location sparking a debate on a daring rescue. Initially confrontational, Luke's understanding of shifting his strategy to appeal to Han's materialistic side showcases his growth, serving as a stepping stone in Luke's journey towards becoming a more well-rounded and strategic character. Han, Luke and Chewie unite and embark on a Death Star rescue mission. Unscripted moments here add authenticity, like Hamill's off-camera frustration about not being able to see out of the Stormtrooper's helmet being integrated into the film. I can't see a thing in this helmet and Harrison Ford suggesting that everyone in the elevator face the wrong way upon exiting all contribute to the film's charming and adventurous tone. While being convincing at a glance, upon closer inspection, the plan quickly falls apart, leading to an explosive confrontation. The laser blasts fired in this enclosed space feel especially perilous due to their dramatic and exaggerated detonations. This approach to the gunfire adds a thrilling intensity to the action sequences, making the battles more immersive and enhancing the overall sense of danger and excitement. Defeating the Imperial officers and troopers, Han attempts to delay a response humorously while Luke rescues the princess. A firefight erupts in the detention center. The confined space intensifies the scene's claustrophobia, adding to the tension. Pinned down by enemy fire, Leia takes charge by blasting a hole in the vent, leading the group to safety. The visual spectacle of the battle, combined with the engaging character dynamics, propels the narrative forward and sets the stage for the hero's leap into the unknown. This moment also does a great job of flipping a fairy tale trope that being the damsel in distress. Taking charge of the moment underscores Leia's empowerment and agency, emphasizing that she is not a damsel in distress, but an active participant in her own rescue and a larger fight. Her proactive approach challenges traditional gender roles, portraying her as a strong and independent character. Vader discloses Obi-Wan's presence on the Death Star to Tarkin, who immediately rejects the notion, echoing the common belief of the Jedi's extinction. However, the message of Leia's escape confirms Vader's earlier claim. 
Believing that Obi-Wan has no intention of escaping heightens the narrative stakes, drawing upon these characters' long-standing history and unresolved conflicts. Look, while I'm trying to stay as objective as possible while analysing the significance of the film, I'm not going to lie, I do not care for the garbage compactor scene. While visually impressive with great practical effects, it just fails to work for me. One reason is that the scene feels like a diversion from the main plot, interrupting the momentum of the story. While it aims to create tension, the danger feels somewhat contrived, as it's hard to believe that the heroes will meet their end in the trash compactor, especially after they've just rescued the princess. It doesn't help that the villains in the film don't even seem to be aware that this moment is happening, meaning they have no agency in the scene. The slow pacing and lack of significant character development also contribute to its lack of engagement. Ultimately, while it provides a moment of suspense and showcases the film's creativity, it doesn't carry the same weight or excitement as other pivotal moments in the story. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan sneaks his way to the tractor beam controls, managing to shut down the beam. The visual scale behind these scenes can be attributed to the talents of Harrison Ellenshaw, the artist responsible for crafting the impactful matte paintings for the film. Alan Shaw's contributions, notably showcasing the grandeur of the Great Hall and extensively throughout the Death Star and the Rebel base, transcend mere visual embellishment. They provide a realistic scale and depth to the film's locations. After engaging in some more banter and bonding, the group navigates the Death Star. Will somebody get this big walking carpet out of my way? No reward is worth this. Upon reaching the hangar housing the Millennium Falcon, their escape is thwarted by a sudden appearance of stormtroopers, triggering a fast-paced and suspenseful sequence. While Han and Chewie chase and then subsequently run away from the Empire, Luke and Leia find themselves stranded near a perilous chasm, a scenario reminiscent of the classic Flash Gordon serials. The addition of Ellen Shaw's matte painting in post-production creates the illusion of a bottomless pit, emphasising the dramatic tension. Notably, Hamill and Fisher executed the swing sequence perfectly, only after to perform the stunt once. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan runs into his former apprentice in the climactic confrontation. I've always loved how Vader's just standing there with his lightsaber already on, ready to go. He's just standing there, menacingly! Obviously, the choreography isn't outstanding, and it's one of the most dated aspects of the film. Not even the lightsabers really hold up, suffering from a first attempt at the technology. While I love Sir Alec Guinness in this role, he's near perfect, you can't help but wonder how this scene would look if Toshiro Mifune was cast as Obi-Wan. It'd definitely make this scene and the choreography a lot better due to his experience in Kurosawa's films. To create the iconic sound of the lightsaber, Ben Burt combined the sounds of a 35mm projector and a 70s tube TV, creating an iconic sound that everyone just knows what it is when they hear it. While Guinness's spin doesn't hold up, it's easily the worst spin in the Star Wars franchise. The duel between Darth Vader and Obi-Wan is a pivotal moment that emphasises Obi-Wan's role as a sage mentor rather than a physically dominant warrior. Throughout the encounter, Obi-Wan demonstrates his calm and collected demeanour, prioritising the greater good over personal victory. His focus is on guiding Luke and allowing the heroes to escape, rather than defeating Vader in combat. By willingly sacrificing himself, Obi-Wan underscores his understanding of the Force and the importance of selflessness. This portrayal reinforces Obi-Wan's role as a spiritual guide, whose strength lies in his wisdom and understanding of the Force, rather than in physical prowess. As the crew reach the Falcon, Luke spots the fight on the far side of the hangar. Seeing that Luke is near the Falcon and will make it out of the Death Star, Obi-Wan sacrifices himself, his body disappearing as Vader swings the killing blow. While Luke alerts everyone to their presence, Obi-Wan's ghostly voice propels Luke back to the Falcon. Obi-Wan's sacrifice magnifies the mysticism of the Force, aligning with its overarching themes, echoing Obi-Wan's assertion that he becomes more powerful than you can possibly imagine. After escaping the Death Star, Leia comforts Luke over his loss. Although it's most likely an oversight, I couldn't find a single quote from Lucas directly addressing this moment. This scene vividly highlights Leia's compassion for others despite her own suffering. While the film does not explicitly delve into her grief over the destruction of Alderaan, Leia's actions reveal her profound empathy. Even in the midst of her immense personal loss, she demonstrates remarkable compassion towards Luke, prioritising his well-being and needs. This moment, whether intentional or not, speaks volumes about Leia's character, making her a figure of exceptional emotional strength and moral fortitude. Though from vastly different backgrounds, both characters share a common thread of having lost everything to the oppressive might of the Empire. The parallel between Leia's loss on a galactic scale and Luke's more personal connection to Obi-Wan Kenobi underscores the universality of suffering under Imperial tyranny. In this shared moment of destitution, the film skillfully bridges the gap between the macro and micro impacts of the Empire's cruelty, creating a poignant moment of grief and resilience. 
However, Luke isn't given much time to grieve, as he and Han Solo originally grapple with a pursuing squadron of TIE fighters. This post-tragedy scene offers a platform for John Williams to showcase his musical brilliance. As the pair desperately try to shoot down the TIE fighters, Williams' score, particularly the iconic TIE fighter attack theme, takes centre stage. Importantly, it makes the scene fun, encapsulating the spirit of adventure that defines the Star Wars saga. The combination of dynamic visuals and Williams' musical prowess transforms this scene into a thrilling and memorable cinematic experience. One element of Star Wars I've yet to mention is the pacing. Renowned for its brisk and energetic pacing, the film's narrative unfolds with urgency, keeping audiences captivated from the beginning. One of the strengths of the film's pacing lies in its ability to balance action with character-driven moments. While the narrative moves quickly, it still allows for meaningful interactions and development, particularly evident in scenes like the just mentioned Obi-Wan sacrifice. The film's fast pacing was a deliberate choice by George Lucas to capture the spirit of classic adventure serials. This choice keeps audiences engaged and contributes to the film's timeless and exhilarating quality. After the battle, while Han is cocky and triumphant, Leia points out that the escape was far too easy. And she's right, with the tracker placed on the Falcon, Tarkin will finally know the location of the rebel base. This revelation underscores Han Solo's pragmatism, as he unapologetically reiterates his expectation of a substantial reward for his pivotal role in the mission. While the dialogue lacks subtlety, it perfectly aligns with Han's character. I expect to be well paid. I'm in it for the money. Reaching the Rebel base, the Death Star plans can finally be accessed from R2. In the Rebel War Room, General Dodonna guides the Rebels through the plans, emphasizing the station's thermal exhaust port as its main weakness. While many Rebel pilots view this mission as impossible, Luke remains upbeat, eager for the mission. His youthful bravado in this moment foreshadows the conclusion of his hero's journey, contributing to thematic cohesion. His confidence and eagerness to face the challenge reflect his transition from an ordinary farm boy on Tatooine to a burgeoning hero ready to take on the galaxy's greatest threat. Attempts to persuade Han to stay and join the rebellion's fight against the Empire. On the other hand, Han remains entrenched in his pragmatic and self-serving mindset. This conflict of values adds depth to their characters and sets the stage for Han's eventual moral evolution. Harrison Ford's performance as Han Solo is a standout in this scene. His portrayal captures the essence of Han's roguish charm, blended with a sense of detachment. Han's nonchalant demeanor and dismissive responses emphasize his initial reluctance to embrace a cause larger than himself. The scene's emotional resonance is heightened by the character dynamics established earlier in the film. Han's gradual shift from a self-serving smuggler to a reluctant hero is hinted at through his interactions with Luke and Leia. The tension between individualism and collective responsibility becomes a central theme, echoing the broader conflict between the Rebellion and the Empire. Just as Luke dismissed his call to adventure and paid the price, he encourages Han to not make the same mistake. As Luke has said, because if you don't do anything about the Empire, the Empire will eventually crush you. To not make a decision is a decision. Ultimately, this scene is a crucial turning point for Han Solo's character arc. The audience is primed for a transformative journey that will see Han evolve from a self-serving smuggler to a critical figure in the Rebellion's fight for freedom. In the lead up to the battle against the Death Star, Rebels hastily prepare X-Wings for their impending clash. Meanwhile, the Death Star slowly moves into firing position, ready to destroy the Rebels once and for all. Wanting the ending battle to have a visual grandeur from the project's inception, Lucas immersed himself and the crew in a desired sense of movement by compiling footage of flying World War II planes, laying the foundation for the dynamic and thrilling space battle. The commitment to realism, even in a fantastical setting, adds a layer of visceral impact to the scene. However, the battle against the Death Star posed significant challenges during post-production and editing. It's worth noting that this was the first time anyone in cinema had created this kind of scene to this scale, causing multiple headaches about how this sequence would even work. To maintain tension and pacing, entire sections of the fight were cut, including the blue crew fighting alongside red and gold. Painful as these cuts were, they were necessary for narrative coherence and heightened suspense. Despite the editing complexities, the end result is an effectively climactic battle that has stood the test of time. Mostly. Even by today's standards, most special effects retain their visual impact, while some effects clearly show their age and lack of budget. However, it's indisputable that the battle against the Death Star is a triumph of filmmaking, seamlessly blending practical effects, strategic editing, and a director's vision committed to pushing the boundaries of cinematic storytelling. The enduring legacy of this sequence lies not just in its spectacle, but in the meticulous craftsmanship that went into creating a cinematic experience that continues to captivate audiences across generations. The battle reaches its zenith as rebels initiate the trench run, catching the Empire off guard. Sensing the danger, Vader takes two Imperial pilots with him to stop the trench run. With Vader in hot pursuit, the rebels manage to deploy a torpedo, but it fails to set off the chain reaction. 
With the rebels being shot down, it all comes down to Luke. As he navigates the trench, the stakes are heightened when Obi-Wan's ethereal voice instructs him to use the Force. Use the Force, Luke. Let go, Luke. This pivotal moment marks Luke's leap of faith. Turning off his targeting computer, Luke taps into the mystic power of the Force, showcasing his growth as a character and his willingness to trust in something beyond the tangible. The audience is left on the edge of their seats as Vader closes in on the unsuspecting Luke. However, just as Vader is about to deliver a decisive blow, Han Solo swoops in with the Millennium Falcon, disrupting the Sith Lord's pursuit. Han's decision to save Luke and the Rebels during the trench run is a key moment that encapsulates both the hero's journey and the fairy tale structure of the film. In the hero's journey, a hero often undergoes a significant transformation, evolving from a self-serving individual to a key player in the collective struggle. Han's unexpected heroism embodies this transformative arc, as he shifts from a self-centered smuggler to a crucial ally who risks his life for the greater cause. Han's act of bravery aligns with a fairy tale motif where characters evolve through acts of selflessness and courage. His choice to return and assist Luke during the crucial trench run demonstrates his commitment to the rebel cause and his newfound sense of loyalty and camaraderie. Additionally, this act of sacrifice reinforces the bonds among the main characters. It adds emotional depth to the narrative, emphasizing how individual actions contribute to the broader heroic journey, underscoring the transformative power of selfless deeds. As the Death Star looms large and the rebel forces hold their breath, Luke, guided by the Force, fires the proton torpedoes into the thermal exhaust port. Hole in one. The triumphant explosion that follows, accompanied by John Williams' iconic score, is a cathartic release of tension. The destruction of the Death Star not only marks a military victory for the Rebellion, but symbolises the triumph of hope, teamwork, and the indomitable spirit against overwhelming odds. Having survived in his TIE fighter, Vader has an awkward call to make to the Emperor. The ending ceremony of Star Wars serves as a triumphant combination of the film's narrative arc, blending cinematic craftsmanship, character resolution, and thematic resonance. As the Rebel Alliance celebrates their victory over the Empire, the ending ceremony is a spectacle of imagery and symbolism. The ceremonial awarding of medals is a nod to classic hero tales. It reinforces the archetypal journey of the film's protagonists, highlighting their growth and shared commitment to the Rebel cause. Thematically, the ending ceremony reinforces the film's core motifs of hope, unity, and resistance. Lucas crafts a conclusion that satisfies the immediate story and lays the groundwork for the expansive and enduring Star Wars saga. Yes, I bet you have. <laughs> Reflecting on the journey to make Star Wars, Lucas has always been pessimistic. I couldn't have done it any better because I tried to do it as well as I possibly could, but I certainly fell far short of what I wanted. For better or worse, Lucas's mindset of this film has caused him to make hundreds of changes, and it even began in 1977. A wider release in 1977 had numerous changes, including a few visual alterations and several audio changes, such as including a line by C-3PO during this scene. He'll try to make the precise location appear on the monitor. He'll try to make the precise location appear on the monitor. The tractor beam is coupled to the main reactor in seven locations. A power loss at one of the terminals will allow the ship to leave. A significant change appeared in the 1981 re-release, where the line Episode 4 A New Hope was added to the opening crawl. For my sanity, this video won't be going over every single change. Still, it's worth noting that Star Wars has undergone hundreds of changes with every re-release. From the special editions to the Blu-ray release, and even during the Disney era. My country. <laughs> Some of the changes I like, such as the bigger explosions, especially the big ring around the Death Star, and the change of all the English text to Arabesh, the Star Wars language. I like Obi-Wan's big dramatic scream because of how silly it is. <laughs> and I even like some of the CGI additions, even if they're now more dated than the 70s special effects. They add a sense of scale and life to the location. In fact, whenever the CGI is in the background or from a distance, it works to enhance the visuals. I absolutely hate this shot though. Yeah sure George, is that a big shitty CGI dinosaur right in front of the screen? Brilliant. 
One of the most controversial changes was made to the confrontation between Han Solo and Greedo in the Moss Eisley Cantina. In the original version, Han shoots Greedo without warning, reinforcing Han's rogue nature. However, in the special edition, a CGI alteration made it seem like Greedo shot at Han first, leading to Han's response. Lucas didn't like the idea that the first thing Han Solo does in the film is gunning somebody down, becoming a cold-blooded killer, something he never wanted the character to be, preferring that the hero always fires second in self-defense. However, altering this scene negatively impacts Han's character, diluting his roguish and morally ambiguous nature. The scene's purpose is to establish Han as a scoundrel with a rough exterior and a willingness to act in his best interest, even if it means resorting to violence. To put it simply, he shoots first and asks questions later. The alteration suggests a more morally upright version of Han, which goes against his whole arc in the film and affects the complexity and ambiguity of his original characterization. Also, although Lucas's change is meant to imply Han acting in self-defense, Han already was acting in self-defense when he shot Greedo first. It's heavily suggested by Greedo that he will kill Han either right now or sometime very soon, forcing Han to act in self-defense. He's not gunning down Greedo like a cold-blooded killer. Anyway, the change undermines Han Solo's character, making him a more conventional hero instead of the charming yet morally grey figure that audiences grew to love. Jabba's introduction is another change to the film that I hate more than the Who Shot First debacle. The addition of Jabba the Hutt in the special edition of Star Wars is a change from the original 1977 release, in which Jabba was only mentioned but not shown. However, in the 97 special edition, a CGI version of Jabba was inserted over Declan Mulholland's performance in the scene where they confront Han Solo in the docking bay on Tatooine. I hate this addition for numerous reasons. In the original version, Jabba was a mysterious character shrouded in mystery with only references to him by other characters. The decision to show Jabba in the special edition removes that mystique in replace of now dated CGI. Also, this altered the physical interaction between Han and Jabba, making it seem awkward and diminishing the sense of threat that Jabba was supposed to convey. Han stepping on Jabba's tail undermines Jabba's supposed power and influence. Han steps on the tail of one of the biggest crime laws in the galaxy and none of Jabba's bodyguards step in and Jabba himself is okay with it? It's a terrible scene that makes no sense and is something that was already established in Han's confrontation with Greedo. In essence, while some changes enhance visual appeal and add depth to the Star Wars universe, others have sparked debates and raised concerns about preserving the film's original charm and intent. Lucas's continuous alterations reflects his dissatisfaction with the film, but also invites scrutiny and discourse within the passionate Star Wars fanbase. Star Wars or Star Wars Episode IV New Hope as it's known now, stands not only as a groundbreaking cinematic achievement, but also as a testament to the enduring impact of visionary storytelling. George Lucas, driven by a relentless pursuit of his creative vision, crafted a space opera that transcended its modest origins, captivating audiences worldwide. Through a lens that intertwines filmmaking techniques, narrative intricacies, and cultural significance, the analysis reveals the film's multifaceted brilliance. Yet, the film's enduring legacy is not untouched by controversy, as subsequent alterations by Lucas spark debates among fans regarding the preservation of the original narrative and character nuances. Despite this, the film's timeless appeal lies in its ability to transport audiences to a galaxy far, far away and inspire generations with its universal themes of heroism, hope, and the timeless struggle against tyranny. Star Wars not only revolutionized the cinematic landscape, but embedded itself in the collective consciousness causing many to ask, what happens next?